most so-called quote-unquote normal folk usually live under the illusion that when they use the word I, they are referring to some presence which is inside of the body. And they say, for example, I can feel my foot. I can feel my nose. I can feel my hand. I can feel the hot tea going down my gut. I can feel that my stomach is upset. I can feel this. I can feel that. I can sense this. I can smell that. I can hear this. And all that is associated with some kind of awareness. But is that awareness in the body? I want you to kind of imagine the following scenario. You're in a room, and in that room with you is this humongous elephant. And it's so big that you wish it would kind of go away. So you figure out a way that you can make it invisible. Uh, you lower the lights in a certain way. You do something so that that elephant suddenly kind of like disappears from view. It's still there, but you kind of ignore it. You're ignoring the elephant in your own room. I want you to kind of think that your essential self or soul, or this thing I'm talking about, is this elephant. I mean, I want to talk a little bit about your relationship to it. Well, first of all, let's find out how you and the elephant get together. There have been experiments done, and now I'm going to talk a little bit about neurophysiology. There have been experiments done in which people have looked at when and where you become conscious of events that are taking place. Now, we normally tend to believe that we become conscious of things as they take place, and that we normally believe that when we wish something to happen, we just intend or wish or bring it into our consciousness. Like, for example, I want to have a cigar. So I go for the cigar box and I pick out a cigar. Of course, now you don't smoke cigars anymore. So I want to have a cup of tea. So I get up, I go to the kitchen, I boil some water, I take out a, some tea, put it in a pot, blah, blah, blah. Whatever it is, we think we're in control. We have this sense that we're the one that's creating that scenario. But I want you to consider this. These neurophysiologists who've done these experiments, and now I'm referring to a guy by the name of Benjamin Libet and Bertram Feinstein. These are two that I often refer to in my work who did some early neurophysiology, did some experimentation on people that for one reason or another had to go through brain surgery, which meant that parts of their brains had to be excised because they were either cancerous or there was a growth of some sort that was beginning to show that it could interfere with neural conduction, whatever. The brain, by the way, is a rather interesting thing because what it has, actually, it has neural tissue, which is where all that conduction, electricity, and stuff goes on, but it also has supporting tissue. They're called glia or glue. Glia means glue, actually. They're the structural cells that support and separate so that the various neurons don't all glump together in one great big neuronal pile. The glia are the cells that usually have problems. When you have a brain tumor, they're the ones that have the tumor. Anyway, these are people that were having a surgical procedure done, which meant that the skull cap had to be removed, and the surface of the brain was exposed to the surgeon's knife. And during this time in the early 80s, it was also possible to do experiments in which you could put electrodes, that is paste little pasties with little tiny wires attached to them. Uh, you could paste these electrodes on the brain and you could look to see when certain parts of the brain would fire. Now, the reason this is interesting, of course, is that the neocortex, the cortical region of the, of the brain, has information that tells us when we are sensing information. For example, if somebody were to grab my right hand and squeeze it, you could actually see 
in my neocortical regions in the somatosensory area of my brain, which is on the surface, you could actually see electrical firing going on, telling me that that is my right hand being squeezed. If it was my left hand being squeezed, you would see across a fissure, you would see the other side of the brain firing, and that would tell you that was the other hand being squeezed. Or if I was smelling a flower, that would be a certain area of the oral cortex, the smell cortex. Or if I was seeing something, it would be the occipital cortex that would be firing. In other words, various parts of the brain would fire according to sensations that were being received in the brain. That makes sense. The brain obviously got to be involved in what's going on and your sensing of the world around you. Okay, so what was happening is... Ben Libet would actually paste electrodes at various parts of the brain and look to see when the brain actually fired and try to figure out what was actually going on in terms of timing, in terms of when does that brain receive what is called neuronal adequacy? When does it become neuronally full enough with electrical charge in order for the brain to function and the person to willfully get up and do something or respond to the sensation that is being received. That was the basic idea. Okay, well, during these tests, there were some very surprising results that were found. For example, it was found that in order to really respond to a sensory input, the brain needed to kind of collect data over a period of time, not very long, maybe 300 milliseconds, that's a little longer than a quarter of a second or so, or up to a half a second, and then it would achieve what is called neuronal adequacy, and at that point it seemed to be able to deal with the information that was coming to it from the body that was sending, you know, through the neurons up to the brain, that kind of information, like squeezing your hand or feeling an ice cube with your toe or something like that. Okay, well, what's amazing about that is that when you have an experience like squeezing your hand being squeezed or when you have an experience of stepping on a hot coal or something like that, it doesn't take anything like a quarter of a second or a half a second for you to respond to it. Otherwise, your foot would burn off. I mean, it Do you have any food reserves in your home right now? How long could you provide food for your family if the food supply was cut off? A month? A week? Three days? Wouldn't you feel better if you had the necessary reserves? Have you ever noticed that the more advanced we get, the less prepared we are? Many things that defined life only a hundred years ago are so convenient today that we don't really think about what would happen if that convenience were gone. Consider how we get our food. We just go down to the grocery store and grab a few things. But what if something happened that interrupted the food supply to the store? How long would it take for the shelves to be wiped out? What would you do? How long could you and your family survive? You know, for all the other important things in our lives, we have a variety of professionals, from mechanics to doctors, to help cover our bases. Why don't we also have a food professional? Food is our greatest dependency, yet most of us find ourselves unprepared for the uncertainties that lie ahead. Why take chances? Why not do something about it? You've already taken the first step. Keep moving forward with this tour and we can help you put a plan together and even show you how to get your food for free. 